The legions of Rome's Republic and Empire are popularly regarded as the greatest military force of antiquity, but not just for their proficiency in the open field. By using their engineering and construction abilities as another weapon against their enemies, the Roman army became one of the most effective siege armies in the history of the world. Taking a city or fortress can demoralize the enemy into an early capitulation, while becoming bogged down before the walls of an enemy settlement can stall a whole war effort. The importance of ancient siege warfare makes it critical that we analyze how and why the Romans were so competent at it, despite preferring to settle their wars in battle. Shout out to the sponsor of this video, Raid Shadow Legends. This collection RPG game is already a mega hit, as more than 10 million players worldwide enjoy its epic awesomeness. Raid Shadow Legends will take you to the world of dark fantasy and realism. Collect over 400 champions, among them our favorite royal huntsmen. Gather orcs, undead, knights, elves and others. Assemble a team from 16 heroic factions and enjoy a fully voiced campaign covering 13 spectacular locations. What we love about this game is that everyone can find something for themselves. Some love collecting characters, some are all about the storyline and graphics. The game is free to play and you can enjoy both PvP and PvE. Raid has more than 300,000 reviews with an almost perfect store rating and is growing super fast. Check out this cool roadmap they've published showing the updates for the next 6 months. There is infinite content for you to enjoy, no time to get bored. There's a new faction, a tag team arena feature and even a new clan boss you'll be able to fight with your clan mates. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click on the special links, and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. At the end of the 4th century BC, two drastically different approaches to siege warfare were being practiced in separate parts of the Mediterranean. In 306 BC, the eastern Mediterranean world was being terrorized by the sophisticated siege craft of Demetrius Polyocrates, or Demetrius the Besieger. Most notable was the use of massive siege towers known as Helepolis during his attempts to take Salamis and Rhodes. His methods were a culmination of centuries worth of development by Greek and Macedonian engineers, supported by kings such as Philip II of Macedon. Further west, the embryonic Roman Republic was still only tiny, and was in 306 BC embroiled in a war against their Samnite neighbours to the south. In comparison to the sophisticated siege craft of Demetrius and his fellow Diadochi, Roman methodology at this point was far more simple – get up the walls with ladders and storm the place, as they did at the siege of Silvium. However, Roman encounters during the 3rd century BC with Carthaginian and Macedonian siege tactics demonstrated their effectiveness to the ever-pragmatic Republic. Gradually, the Romans began to adopt and adapt more advanced methods of siegecraft, and we shall attempt to discuss them, starting with ranged artillery. While light torsion artillery was used to great effect by the Romans in battle on occasion, it was far more common to see such contraptions utilized during sieges. Two varieties of ranged machines were routinely employed against targets – the one-armed onager and the two-armed ballista. The onager, or wild ass, looked like a later medieval mangonel and was named for its powerful kickback upon firing. On one occasion, Ammianus even states that one of these devices killed a crewman in this way when it misfired. The device itself possessed a single upright arm which was cranked back and then fired being capable of throwing a stone with considerable force using the tension of twisted ropes or springs. More commonly used by the Romans were their two-armed ballistae, an oversized crossbow-like artillery piece capable of firing stones and what were essentially giant crossbow bolts. Both an individual ballista and its ammunition could vary in size, all the way from portable-sized units called scorpions to massive lance throwers. Byzantine historian Procopius described the frightening capacity of these weapons. He tells us that a ballista bolt once penetrated the chest armor and body of a Gothic soldier, who was then pinned against a tree by the sheer force exerted by the projectile. Although these artillery units were without doubt powerful, they were unable to breach well-constructed and substantial earthen or stone walls, contrary to the popular medieval and modern conceptions of artillery. 
Instead, they were primarily used as suppression fire anti-personnel devices, a secondary means of attack while the main siege works were prepared. At Jerusalem in AD 70, for example, Roman artillerists loosed stones and bolts towards the defenders on the walls in order to give cover to their advancing legionary comrades while they stormed the breach around the city's western gate. This had the secondary impact of also neutralizing the defenders' artillery, which was consequently rendered unusable. The late Roman writer Vegetius tells us that each century of 80 men was ideally to be armed with a scorpion, otherwise known as a caroballista, while each cohort which the centuries comprised were to possess a larger ballista. This was probably only a base allotment, and it is likely that these figures would be increased or decreased based on the practical needs of the military formations in question. In addition, these numbers probably changed throughout Roman history as doctrines gradually changed. The troops who actually operated the artillery were ordinary soldiers, possibly volunteers, drawn from the ranks rather than specially employed artillerists. Therefore, the quality of crews varied between different legions. The Jewish Roman writer Josephus tells us that of the Roman formations subduing the great Jewish revolt, the men of Legio X Fratensis were the most expert at siegecraft. Since ancient Roman artillery was mostly incapable of breaching strong walls or other fortifications, other means had to be employed to do so. The most simple and rudimentary of these methods was by using pickaxes, crowbars, and other manual tools to detach stones and undermine specific points in enemy defences. Interestingly, this is where we most often see use of the Roman defensive testudo formation in history. An overlapping layer of shields was used in order to protect a group of legionaries from projectiles as they approached enemy walls or retreated from them. During one siege in the Civil War of AD 69, a group of defenders grew so desperate in their attempts to break an enemy testudo that they pushed one of their own catapults off the wall to crush it. This succeeded in flattening the attacking legionnaires, but also tore down a section of their own wall, leading to a breach. The Romans, just like empires since ancient Assyria or perhaps even earlier, used battering rams as one of the primary methods to knock holes through walls. Engineers would construct massive devices, usually mounted in wheeled sheds known as ram tortoises, which served the same purpose as the testudo but on a larger scale, to protect its crew from missiles. The battering ram itself was a long beam of wood, perhaps fir or mountain ash, bound with thick ropes to prevent it from splitting under the pressure. The ram's head was made of iron, and was traditionally shaped to resemble the head and horns of a butting ram. Alternatives to breaching through an enemy wall were going either under or over it, or both. Below the wall, Roman sappers could dig tunnels underneath enemy fortifications, which were then filled with supports and combustible material. When the time was right, the combustibles would be ignited and the supports removed, collapsing the tunnel and hopefully bringing down a section of the wall with it. If this was not possible, the only option left was to get over the wall and secure them by storm, the traditional Roman way. This was the most outwardly deadly way of breaking the defence of a fortification, during which the assaulting troops using scaling ladders would attempt to get atop the walls. This required careful judgement to ensure that ladders being used were of a sufficient length, and to ensure that casualties wouldn't be too catastrophic for no gain. When climbing the ladders, Roman soldiers were exposed to missiles of all kinds, arrows, stones, javelins and others. Moreover, the ladders themselves could easily be overturned or broken, sending the legionaries tumbling back to earth. Even if a small unit of troops managed to establish a bridgehead on the walls, reinforcements could only ascend to join them slowly. Therefore, it was relatively common for defenders to concentrate in numbers, attack and push the Romans away. A more effective but more high-maintenance method of surmounting the walls was offered by the construction of siege towers. They could often lower a drawbridge onto the ramparts, permitting men to approach the wall in cover and then cross onto it in larger numbers. Siege towers in the Roman world developed over time, but in a different manner to those of their Greek counterparts. 
For the most part, the guiding principle of military engineering in the Roman world was functionality above all, and the manufacture of siege towers was no exception. In contrast, the Hellenistic fascination was with awesome size and a spectacular nature, often disregarding their practicality to an extent. That being said, initial Roman uses of siege towers were blundered to an almost comic degree. When they were sieging a Greek town named Atrax during the Macedonian Wars, their inexperience with heavy machinery led to one of their siege towers getting stuck in a rut in the ground and almost falling over. By the mid-1st century AD, however, Roman siege towers had been all but perfected, and Vegetius gives us a comprehensive description of how they might have appeared. For stability, taller towers would require wider base dimensions, 30, 40 or 50 feet squared, for example. The heights of these towers were not excessive, and 10-storey structures are recorded in the time of Caesar. During the Great Jewish Revolts and the sieges at Jerusalem and Masada, siege engines as large as 87 feet are mentioned by Josephus. On the bottom level of Vegetius's siege towers was a battering ram. A boarding bridge or exostra was present on the mid-level, while a fighting platform for archers and spearmen was on top, whose task was to provide covering fire. To accomplish their function, Siege towers and other wall-breaking machines would have to get to the fortification, and this was often the hardest part of the job. How did the Romans facilitate the movement of their engines? Uneven landscapes and sophisticated outer defences were dealt with by simply burying them beneath a wide embankment or siege ramp known as an agar. To create these makeshift embankments, thousands of tons of earth and rubble would be piled up beginning some distance from the would-be victim at ground level and gradually moving higher and closer. Larger aggers often required bracing at the sides by timber shoring so that the debris would not just flow out to the edges. The siege works could be absolutely incredible in scale, rivaling Alexander the Great's construction of the causeway during his siege of Tyre. At Avaricum in 52 BC, Caesar built an agar which eventually reached a mammoth 80 feet tall and 330 feet wide. It was able to accommodate two siege towers side by side to serve as protection for the construction crew, but was primarily made for the purpose of being a staging area for a mass legionary assault upon completion. We do not have to rely entirely on ancient writings for details of these huge works of engineering. On the shores of the Dead Sea, the remnants of a massive Roman-era agar used by the troops of Legio X Fratensis to reach the walls of Masada can be seen. It is worth noting that this structure was unusually steep due to the necessity of that specific siege. Those Roman soldiers undertaking such large-scale movements of earth required extensive protection from enemy fire, which was accomplished mainly by the use of two different types of shielding, the Winaea and the Pluteus. The Winair was a light, open-ended timber structure with wicker sides, a sloped, boarded roof, and a fireproof covering. They were arranged end-to-end, -end and were capable of forming long corridors which workers could travel through. Meanwhile, the Pluteus was a more mobile but still large convex wicker shield with an arced roof and a triangular base, serving as frontal protection for soldiers emerging from the Winair. Unfortunately, after all of this was done, legionaries would often be so furious at the fact that they had been besieging the city for so long, or that they had lost comrades in the fight, that the sacking would be terrible. Tens of thousands of people could be killed and their property seized as loot, taken as a reward by the legionaries. Though generals would sanction this kind of behaviour, it was just as common for them to lose control of the soldiers while they had their way with the settlement which had been taken by siege. If the defenders opened the gates before a siege became necessary, however, it was common to allow a peaceful surrender. Our series on the Roman armies will continue all the way to 1453, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.